Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Invisible Underground, an activity developed by the Wisconsin Energy Institute in partnership with Michigan State University. Today, we're going to talk about the rhizosphere, which is a specific area of the soil. We're going to talk about what exactly the rhizosphere is, and we're going to talk about how it helps plants grow and how it's important to us. Before we get started, I'd just like to mention that for each participant, you'll need a piece of paper, a writing utensil, and it'd be nice to have some colors to choose from, but that's not completely necessary. You'll also need one to four feet of yarn, a small handful of beads, and some scissors and glue to share among the class. Now, before we get started, I'd just like to tell you guys a little bit about who I am and who I'm here representing today. My name is Lucas, and I'm a student education and outreach programming assistant at the Wisconsin Energy Institute, which is located on the UW-Madison campus where I'm also a student. And it's basically a big research building that's the primary home for the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, or the GLBRC. And basically what the GLBRC does is it collects researchers from all over the country, including researchers at MSU. And these researchers solve important problems in today's society, like how can we produce fuel and products from sustainably grown plants? So here's what I have planned for you today. First off, we're gonna talk about what plants need to survive. Then we're gonna talk about invisible life forms that live underneath the soil that help plants survive, super cool. And then we're gonna use arts and crafts to model these invisible life forms and show how they help plants grow and how they interact with each other. While I'm going through this presentation today, be on the lookout for some scientific vocab that I've outlined and highlighted in blue. These are terms that we use all the time at the Wisconsin Energy Institute and the GLBRC. So first off, let's talk about what plants need to survive exactly. There are four main things that every plant needs to thrive. Take a moment and think to yourself. Maybe pause the video and allow the class to discuss this. What are these four things that every plant needs? And here they are. Plants need sunlight, which they use for photosynthesis, which your class might have already learned about. They also need air. They need to breathe like we do. They also need water and they need nutrients. Now again, I'd like you to take a minute and think to yourself, how exactly do plants get these things? This is a big area of study at the Wisconsin Energy Institute and at the GLBRC. It can get really complex really quickly, but I'd like to just introduce two ways that plants get these important things that they need to live. First of all, Plants take up sunlight and air through their shoots, and that's basically the parts of plants that grow above the ground. They intake water and nutrients from the soil using their roots, and this is what we're going to be mainly focusing on today, is how exactly plants get water and nutrients from the soil using their roots. And the big takeaway I want you guys to have from this activity is that plants are not alone. Plant roots are important but sometimes they can't reach far enough down into the soil to get all of the water and all of the nutrients that they need. Luckily, there are these little tiny organisms living on their roots that help them get these things. And this is the main focus of this activity today. You've probably learned about lots of different creatures that live in the soil. So here we have a mole, I think they're super cute. We have an earthworm and we have some ants. But did you know that there are thousands more little tiny organisms living in the soil that we can't even see? They're so tiny, in fact, that we need a microscope to see them. And that's what this picture on the left is. It's a microscope slide showing some of these little tiny organisms. And these are called microbes, which is just another word for an organism that's so, so tiny that we need a microscope to see it. And these microbes basically help plants grow. They live on the plant roots, giving them nutrients, helping them access water, and fighting diseases for the plant as well. And they even get something in return from the plant. Plants produce food for themselves, or sugars, through the process of photosynthesis. And they give this food to the microbes in exchange for helping the plant do all of these things. Now, what exactly do these things look like? I certainly don't expect you guys to know what they look like because we can never see them when we're out in daily life. 
there are many types of microbes, but today I want to focus on a specific type. Bacteria and fungi are the main microbes that live on plant roots. And we have a specific word for this area where the roots are, and it's called the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is the region of soil in the direct vicinity of the plant roots. That basically means that the rhizosphere is all of the soil that the plant roots touch. And this is where all of the microbes that I'm going to talk about today live. So first off, what do bacteria look like? Well, there are so many different types of bacteria and they're basically everywhere, even though we can't see them. They're in the air, they're in the food that we eat, and they're even inside of our bodies, which sounds kind of creepy at first, but they do so many good things for us, like help us digest our food. Some of them have little tails that help them swim around in aquatic environments. Some of them take important things out of the air, like nitrogen, and turn them into a form that plants can use in order to live a healthy life. Now, when I mentioned fungi a minute ago, you may have thought to yourself, wait a minute, I thought mushrooms were fungi. That doesn't look like a mushroom at all. And you're right, mushrooms are fungi, but they're actually one specific part of a fungus. Mushrooms are what fungi use to reproduce, and they're usually the part that we can see. They grow above the ground. But if you look beneath a mushroom in the soil, you'll see that most of the fungus exists as hyphae, which are long tube-like structures that grow underneath the ground. And that's the main part of a fungus. And these are usually the type of fungi that you'll see living on plant roots. So now that I've given you guys a bit of an introduction as to what microbes are, I'm gonna have you do a little drawing activity to model it. So first off, I'd like you to get your piece of paper and your writing utensil. And I'd like you to draw a horizontal line across your piece of paper, a little bit above the halfway point, just like this. And this line is going to represent the ground. Next, I'd like you to pick a plant that you like and draw that plant several times, pretending that the line is the ground. You could pick any plant you'd like. It could be a tree, it could be a flower, it could be a grass. Maybe this plant produces a food that you like to eat. Maybe it's an ear of corn, maybe it's a berry bush, maybe it's an apple tree. It can be anything you want as long as it grows in the soil. I chose switchgrass for my plant because that's a plant that we like to study a lot at the Wisconsin Energy Institute. We can make fuels out of it, which I think is super cool. And this is what I drew for my switchgrass above the ground here. After you've drawn your plant, I'd like you to take a minute and think about what those plant roots might look like and then draw those roots to the best of your ability on your piece of paper underneath your line. It's totally fine if you don't know what the plant roots look like. Just try and draw what you think they might look like. Because I work at the Wisconsin Energy Institute, I know that switchgrass roots are long and skinny. So I drew them just like this on my piece of paper. Here are some more examples of what plant roots might look like. I think this is a super cool picture because it shows you that there's so much going on underneath the soil that we don't get to see that's super important for plant growth. If you look over here on the right side of the picture, you can see that plants that grow less than a foot tall can have roots that stretch more than 15 feet down underneath the surface of the soil. That's super cool to me. And I think it really shows how important it is for plants to get water and nutrients from the soil. And as you'll see, it's also super important in showing how microbes are important for plants in getting that water and those nutrients. Here are some more examples of plant roots. Maybe you'd like to draw a flower. Maybe you'd like to uh, draw some plants, some grass, excuse me. Next, maybe you'd like to draw a tree. And this can give you an idea of what the tree's roots might look like. Okay. So now that we've drawn our plants and their roots, let's add some microbes, shall we? So your string is going to represent fungi. And remember, the fungi living on plant roots mostly exist as hyphae. Your beads are going to represent bacteria that also live on the plant roots. We're going to attach our string and our beads to our plant roots using glue. So just take a little bit of glue and just do a little dab of glue wherever you want to put your string or your beads. It doesn't have to be a lot at all. Now, 
While you're attaching your fungi and your bacteria to your plant roots, I'd like you to take a minute and think, if I were a microbe, how could I grow in the best possible way to keep my plant healthy? The healthier my plant is, the more food it will be able to produce and the more food I will receive as a result. So microbes really like it when their plant is happy. There are many different ways to do this. Maybe you cut up your string into lots of little tiny pieces and spread them out over your plant roots. Maybe you keep your hyphae all bundled up in a single clump on a single plant root. Maybe you take your beads and you put them all near the surface of the soil. Maybe you put them deep down at the very bottom of the roots. There are so many different ways to approach this, and there are so many different ways that these organisms can grow underground. And I'll show you guys my example. You don't have to do it like this at all, but this is how I chose to orient my microbes underground. All right, now that we've completed our rhizosphere models, let's give everyone a chance to share how they chose to place their string and beads on their piece of paper. In other words, how do you think microbes should grow to help out their plants the most? Anyone can share their drawing if they'd like, and this is a space for everyone to just talk about how they think these microorganisms could best grow. So now that we've gotten a chance to brainstorm as a group how fungi and bacteria might best grow underground to keep their plants healthy, I'd like to show you guys a very short BBC video describing the amazing things that can happen when they grow in the right way. So let's take a look. Trees may look like solitary individuals, but the ground beneath our feet tells a different story. Trees are secretly talking, trading, and waging war on one another. They do this using a network of fungi that grow around and inside their roots. The fungi provide the trees with nutrients, and in return they receive sugars. But scientists have found this connection runs far deeper than first thought. By plugging into the fungal network, trees can share resources with each other. The system has been nicknamed the Wood Wide Web. It's thought that older trees, fondly known as mother trees, use this fungal network to supply shaded seedlings with sugars, giving them a better chance of survival. Those trees that are sick or dying may dump their resources into the network, which might then be used by healthier neighbours. Plants also use fungi to send messages to one another. If they're attacked, they can release chemical signals through their roots, which can warn their neighbours to raise their defences. But like our internet, the wood wide web has its dark side too. Some orchids hack the system to steal resources from nearby trees. And other species, like the black walnut, spread toxic chemicals through the network to sabotage their rivals. Arboreal cybercrime aside, scientists are still debating why plants seem to behave in such an altruistic way. The hidden network creates a thriving community between individuals. When you're next in Woodland, you might like to think of trees as part of a big super organism, chatting and swapping information and food under your feet. I love this video so much. I think it's super cool to know that every time we walk in a forest, all this stuff is happening under the ground and we don't even get to see it. So if you connected the roots of your plants on your drawing together, with your hyphae, that's actually correct. That does happen in nature all the time. And it's a major way that plants can share nutrients with each other and communicate. It's super fascinating. And it's a really big new area of study that the Wisconsin Energy Institute and the GLBRC are very interested in. So given that, I'd like you to finish off your rhizosphere models by drawing one arrow connecting two of the organisms that we've talked about so far. And this arrow can just show a relationship that those organisms have. Let me show you my example. I drew an arrow from my plant roots to my fungal hyphae, and I labeled it shelter, showing that plants can provide shelter to fungi living on their roots. It allows them a place to live, a place where they could be protected and grow. 
I haven't talked about all of the relationships between these organisms because there isn't enough time for me to do so. So just think of one relationship that I've talked about so far and draw that as an arrow on your piece of paper. Here's a little diagram I put together of all the relationships between plants, fungi, and bacteria that you could have drawn on your rhizosphere model. And once again, I didn't talk about all of these relationships, so don't worry if they seem new to you. First off, fungi can give water, nutrients, and the wood wide web to plants. Once again, the wood wide web is what that short video was talking about. It's a network of hyphae that allow trees and other plants to share resources and communicate with one another. In return, plants give food and shelter to the fungi in the rhizosphere. They also give food and shelter to the bacteria living in the rhizosphere as well, and in return, they receive nutrients from that bacteria. Not only can plants have relationships with fungi and bacteria, but fungi and bacteria can have relationships with each other in the rhizosphere as well. Fungi can give food to bacteria in exchange for organic acids, which are basically just chemical compounds that help the fungi grow. So now we've talked all about the different relationships going on in the rhizosphere. And now I'd like you to take a moment and think, where do humans fit into all of this? I'd like you to consider why this information is important to scientists, like the ones at the Wisconsin Energy Institute and the GLBRC. I'd also like you to consider, how is this important to farmers and gardeners who might not be super into science, but are still really concerned about getting nice, healthy plants to grow? Also, how is this information important to you? Does it make you see the world in a different way? Does it make you interested in any topics that you might not have considered beforehand? What could we as a society accomplish if we could help shape the microbes living in the rhizosphere? And last but not least, what's something that you found interesting or something that you want to know more about? I allow you to pause the video at this point to discuss this among the class. You can discuss one of these questions, two of them, or all of them. It's completely up to you. Before I let you all go, I thought I'd just share my own personal perspective on all of the discussion questions we just talked about. When I first learned about the rhizosphere and all the organisms inhabiting it, my big takeaway was that everything is connected. The plants depend on the fungi and the bacteria to live. The fungi and the bacteria depend on each other and on the plant to live. Nature is always working together to figure out solutions to problems and to help all living things thrive. And I don't think we humans are any different from that. We rely on plants and animals to live. It may not seem like it, but we also rely on bacteria and fungi in our daily lives as well. And I think the coolest thing about science is it reveals all those relationships between all the different species out there. It lets us see the big picture. It lets us uncover what's beneath the surface of the things we think we know. And most of all, it lets us see little tiny organisms that we can't see with the naked eye that are around us all the time going about silently and helping us live our lives. I think science is fascinating, and I hope you saw into that world a little bit in today's activity. Once again, thank you so much for joining me to explore the rhizosphere today. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. If you have any further questions, you can reach out, contact us at outreach at energy.wisc.edu. You can learn more about the Wisconsin Energy Institute at energy.wisc.edu, and you can learn more about the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center at glbrc.org. Thank you again, and have a lovely day. Bye.